of $600,000. All's on the line to play for here. Over to the hall. Navi versus Alliance. Alliances turn to battle. And we're back for game number two of this best of three, the upper bracket grand finals, Alliance and Navi, and what has to be the single most anticipated match of the entire tournament so far, Draskal. Both of these teams, usually number one Ten and number two picks three. when you ask who they who, ask people who they think will make it to the grand finals. And certainly Five one of these teams going to be remaining. punching their ticket coming up soon. Right now, Alliance quite a bit closer than Navi. Beating Alliance just time. once is tough enough. Navi going to have to make it two in a row to punch their ticket to the grand finals. But Alliance, they looked so good in game one. Like you said, a lot of it came down to the draft. Masterful picks, masterful draft. They waited out the magic damage. They got the items they needed. And now Navi up against the ropes, facing the possibility of falling to the lower bracket. It was so hard to watch Navi try to play during that game because you just get the looming sense of they were getting behind by virtue of doing nothing, basically. I mean, like they said, they had to gank or Alliance were just going to pull ahead because of their strategy. And as Bruno stated very early on, they got together, they started to push, and they never stopped pushing. Merlini brought up an interesting point, and I don't really think I've seen many teams try to push Alliance. Like, no one has ever really gotten the Chen against them and done anything that spectacular with it. It seems like they're just as good at playing against it as they are playing it themselves. But I think for Navi, just a straight-up push strategy might Navi's be a little bit far-fetched for them. They do favor playing aggressive, but that doesn't necessarily mean going for early towers that often. So we'll see what they want to do this game. They have taken away the Chen, which I think is a good choice if you're Navi, because Alliance, in my opinion, probably the best Chen team in the world, just yeah. hands down. Like, Ake's Chen is just spectacular to watch. So. And that's coming from Navi, who have Puppy. So, I mean, there you go. Nice frame of reference. And you know something everyone has on their mind? As you said, Alliance, their coordination, the way they function as a remaining. unit, their cohesion, makes it so hard to play those grinded out strats, to play Five those push strats. Remaining. They are just so good at dealing with it. Navi will land the Io. Alliances Second time in a row, pick. we saw a pretty good performance out of Kuro. Unfortunately, things have obviously, you already went down all the reasons why. That Io just never really had a chance to, to, to use relocate. He just really wasn't an influence for the most part. Had a few nice plays. With that pickup now, and again, what everyone's thinking, is this the kind of a game where Navi throws a curveball? Is this the kind of a game where they try to get in Alliance's head? And they talked about it at the, at the uh, analyst desk before. Ten you know, there was some mixed remaining. feelings in a lot of the community, including from Alliance, about what Navi did in their Tong Fu match. You and I had the pleasure remaining. of doing that. Absolutely insane. Not I'm not going to say the big boy's name, but it is something that might Alliance possibly uh, be pick. on the menu if Navi really just wants to, to say, you know what? Balls to the wall, we're going for it. We're going to play Navi Dota, not Alliance Dota. Alliance, though, does first pick the Naga Siren once again. We saw just how effective she is at shutting down any kind of aggression. Relocate ganks just are not nearly as reliable when Song of the Siren is a good way to shut it down. We'll see what they want to pick up with their second pick now. I'm a little bit happier with the first pick Wisp this Ten game than I was last game because th the best thing you can do against a Wisp is to play five-man Dota. And what five did Alliance do last game at 13 eight. minutes in? They just never split. So we're going to see Bulldog Nine, on a signature two, hero. And honestly, I feel like he should have two now. It should be more than just Lone Druid. It should be oh, Profit man. as well, especially after his performance so far here at TI3. But back to the Wisp pick, if you see the fact that the Chen's banned out, it makes it so even with split pushing heroes, I think the reason they didn't want to pick Nature's Prophet against it is because Wisp is actually fantastic against split push lineups. You can punish it very easily. So now not only do Navi have to not worry about the five man as Ten much, seconds. Lone Druid can still do it, but not quite to the same effect as a Chen because a Chen's a hero who goes early mech. Seconds, he just all around plays well with the team. Now you're creating the opportunity to split the map. Did Navi want to go for the Prophet here? Reserve it's a bit time. greedy, but Alliance have already shown the Lone Druid and Prophet versus Lone Druid Lone Druid will edge him out, but the Prophet can still do reasonably well in that lane. And finally, it gives Funnick a hero where he doesn't have to do Ancients. Oh, yeah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? The Lone Druid pick up to go with the Naga Siren. As we heard the cheer come up from the crowd, obviously Bulldog, one of the most famous Druid players on the planet. And I'll tell you what makes him amazing on the hero. He can play him in any way, any style that is needed by the team. How many times have we seen Alliance just say, you know what, we're going to offensively try lane just to throw Navi or throw the enemy team Navi's off of their game. We'll leave Lone Druid to solo farm, and he'll get something stupid like a 16-minute Radiance phase boots. He just he has that, uh, that ability. Or he can just go to the offlane, find his farm in the jungle later. He 
still always finds a way to be oh. relevant. Naga Siren's actually a hero that fits in pretty Alliance well with a push lineup if bad. Alliance wants to go in that direction. The fact that she, she allows you to play a lot more aggressive with your pushes and with your ability to take fights early because she can get you out of trouble if you overextend. So it comes down to what Alliance wants to build around it. Do they want to just build an all-around kind of prototypical lineup or do they want remaining. to do something a bit more focused and specific? This in and of itself already Five is a game where I could remaining. easily see Loda wanting to pick up the Alchemist again just because he does fit in with the, the front two now they already have so well. To I think Alchemist is definitely on the table here. I agree with you on that. And it's just going to come down to what Na'Vi's actual game plan is. They could do something, honestly, like a DK mid, because we haven't seen what Alliance are going to pick yet. But having a Lone Druid and a Naga Siren, I'm kind of leaning towards them getting their hands on Puck Ten for the second game in a row. Remaining. Let's be honest, S4 didn't have a great start. He was kind of getting pushed around Five in lane by Dendi, and he remaining. ended up giving away first blood, too. And he still managed to come back in a big way and still be a very Reserve big boon for his team. So I want to know what Na'Vi is going to ban here. They could potentially ban out one of those initiators, because when you see heroes like Lone Druid and Naga Siren together. The Naga Siren on her own really isn't that fantastic. You can stop a push, you can maybe try to turn around a team fight, but you need some real counter initiation to really make use of that song. So I'm leaning towards maybe that for Alliance, and we're going to see what Navi's ban is going to be soon. Well, you see, they took out the gyro, and you're exactly right. That's a hero who fits into that exact mold you were talking about. Being able to take and turn around a fight, they don't want to give that away to Alliance. Alliance getting rid of the OD. And really, both teams taking their sweet time. We could see them really burning through the reserve time, talking out this last ban. But uh, both teams really, as you said, they can go in just about any direction. The only thing we know about Na'Vi is how aggressive they're going to want to be. That Enchantress, I would imagine, is going to be extremely active early on just to free things up. The IO, of course, will be paired with some hero at some point. We're down to 15 seconds on the reserve time right now for Na'Vi. So definitely sweating out the details. Seconds. And they are going to go ahead and take out the Weaver. Alliances so taking out the man. Weaver opens up the lanes a lot for Alliance, of course, and right now they have absolutely zero tools to deal with it. I mean, outside of a tether stun, there's no real lockdown. And overall, it's a really tough hero for supports because he can just Shikuchi in, target you in the fights, and especially things like Ten Wisp. He can kill the Wisp before the relocate counts down. So it's just a very scary thing to have to deal with. And of course, depending on what kind of carry they're going to partner it with, you might not even necessarily be able to stop the Weaver in a sideline push. Where heroes like Nature's Prophet, you probably would be able to. So another band coming out from Alliance. It's actually going to be the Bounty Hunter, which like obviously synergizes Alliance well with Navi's style pick. right now. You can look for the kills. You scout it out. It's very typical to see that hero partnered with Wisp just because of how good he is at finding heroes by themselves. And that kind of says to me that Alliance maybe aren't looking to play the five-man style this game. They've avoided the Chen of... Well, not avoided. The Chen got banned. They didn't pick the Enchantress, so Navi got their hands on it. Maybe Alliance are actually looking to play something a little bit different this game. I wouldn't be surprised to see them go back into something super late game oriented like even, dare I say, a Coddle PL, but oh, it yeah. is on the table here. Absolutely. I really love that Bounty Five Hunter ban because what is it that determines an IO success when it comes to relocation gangs? It's almost always warding. Warding and vision time. and of course bringing, being able to bring down towers, allow you to explore the jungles more often, etc. When you have a bounty hunter, that's a hero who just Alchemist. gives you... Yep, there's that Alchemist pick we anticipated. We saw their success Navi's with that in pick. game one. I'm not surprised at all. And I love this two-core lineup they're going to have. And especially the way that they innately work together. Just between the Lone Druid and the Naga Siren, you have two abilities that... Well, one ability and one RNG that can lock a hero down through BKB. And the Alchemist can close the distance, stay on top of that target. Really limits Navi and how comfortable they're going to be able to feel when they have to fear the Root. They have to fear the Ensnare. But anyway, the, back to that bounty ban, taking it out, Ten that's just a free remaining. roaming ward in the mid game. Whenever a bounty gets off to a decent enough start, he gets up a set Five of phase boots, maybe remaining. one survivability item. So Navi certainly would have loved to have gotten their hands on that hero. Not the case. He's Waiting to see time. what they're going to show us here in third position. So Alliance are sticking to the Five greedy carry like remaining. they did in the first game. As soon as you see a Wisp, yeah. it's very often going to be a short lane hero. Alliance You're not often going to see an aggressive Wisp lane, and especially with the Luna pick. Like, there's no way this lane is going to be aggressive anymore. And showing it this early, uh, Navi are obviously saying, hey, Alliance are probably going to safe lane too. Why not just play it a little bit greedier? But by picking a Luna, you get the early aura. You get the capability of pushing that tower down so much faster. And not only that, but between Lone Druid and Alchemist, you do want some physical damage. 
damage output. You don't want to rely just on magic damage. Luna is a hero who can Ten fight during the mid game, remaining. but she kind of fell out of the competitive scene because so many people were laning against her and just killing her that you couldn't really do anything about it. So people just learn how to deal with her in laning phase, but when you pick her now, after seeing what Alliance's lanes are already shaping up to be, it makes a lot more sense, and I think it's actually a really, really solid pick. And Alliance going with the Keeper of the Light, this is... For me, probably one of the supports they utilize the best, yeah. especially during the mid-late game phases where you start being able to buy back, bring the hero back into the fight, just use the Keeper of the Light as a set of uh, boot to travel, basically, right. just to be able to get back in and I take a fight that would normally be 5 versus 5 and make it like 6 Alliance or 7 versus 5. So, yeah. Nature's Profit pick up here from Na'Vi now, so they definitely have some push potential and more than enough ability to split the map. I'll tell you what, man, looking at Alliance's lineup, I have seen them build lineups like this before. It could very well be that safe lane Alchemist, that farming Alchemist Ten we saw in game remaining. one. But something Alliance is so good at doing, Naga Siren, Alchemist, and Keeper Five of the Light is remaining. a remarkably strong offensive tri lane against what Navi is already showing us. The Luna, as we know, Reserve she time. does get good. She just doesn't have that much lane presence, can be bullied around in a lot of cases. It is nice to have that aura. Enchantress most likely going to want to start out in the jungle. Then you have the lane support, Io, Nature's Prophet, going to want to be in the offlane or the jungle. I love the idea of them isolating Lone Druid against the Nature's Prophet of Na'Vi, putting the pressure on and putting the screws to them right off the bat. Navi's and it's something that they can re ban. reliably do just because of the extremely high individual skill level of Admiral Alliances Bulldog. He just knows everything pick. about Lone Druid and every matchup you can possibly imagine. Rarely does he make mistakes. And more often than not, when isolated and left to himself, when you have the aggressive potential of a Keeper, Alchemist, and Naga Siren, He's going to find his farm and get his items very quickly and then just be able to dominate using his bear to push down towers in the mid game and creating problems all over the map. And yeah, the Lone Druid is the thing that scares me the most about Alliance's lineup. Sure, they have the capability of pushing fights with the Naga Siren, being able to counter push with the Keeper of the Light and obviously Alchemist's farm. But the big thing here, as we see the Tidehunter last pick here from Navi, Lone Druid. It's Admiral Bulldog's Lone Druid. That should be something that a lot of people keep in mind because he is, hands down, the best Lone Druid player in the world. And Funix probably going to be going one versus one against that. So best of luck to him, at least in that matchup. But let's talk about the Tide here for a second. The only person on the side of Alliance who's buying a BKB is the Alchemist. And that is the best hero for counter-initiating after Song of the Siren in the game, hands down. Like, you have to be right on with your Concoction and your Impale if you want to stop him from getting that Ravage off. And to be honest, those heroes have long animations with their spells. Unless Lotus standing right on top of the Tidehunter, there's a chance that he'll just get the Ravage off anyway. Right. And this is something that Navi had actually used in the International 2 when they were playing. I believe it was against IG, and they used that as counter-initiation. So this is a hero that hasn't been played in a long time just because of the supports that are being picked now. But still, Prepare I'm really glad battle. to see him here. I think it's a really solid pick, and it's going to be super early push versus kind of a mid-game push-oriented team of Alliance. See teams beginning to leave the well. We'll go ahead and run through our lineups as the good luck have funds go off on the side of Na'Vi. We'll have Puppy playing on our Enchantress Luna. Going to be handled by Havost. Tidehunter, the surprise pick. That's a dindy tide, if you didn't know. He'll be setting up shop in mid by all accounts. Kuro for the second game in a row. Going to be back on Io and Funnick. Going to be handling the Nature's Prophet on the other side of the river. We got S4. That's the mid player taking the Knicks into that mid lane, perhaps. Keeper of the Light going to be played by Ake. We will have Loda back on Alchemist for the second game in a row. That's going to be EGM. Once again, back on the Naga Siren for the second game in a row as well. And the man himself, Admiral Bulldog, on his signature hero, the Lone Druid. So there's a couple of things here about the defensive tri lanes of each team. Alliance, of course, they're going to get their hands on the Keeper of the Light, which means that you can stack the jungle, you can spam Chakra, you can even duel a jungle if need be to make sure that EGM actually gets something out of it too. But unlike game one, where Na'Vi had two supports who both needed to pull, they actually have an Enchantress this time. So they're not just going to fall really far behind in the laning phase. And yeah, it just shows it right there. They have the highest GPM because they're just so amazingly good at utilizing the map. But this time, Na'Vi aren't really in the same exact position. They have a chance to actually only pull with one. They don't have to split the experience between the two supports, and they have a dedicated jungle. So I do like this. It's a little bit more stable from Na'Vi. It's not as gank reliant as it was in game number one. Luna late game obviously is one of the strongest heroes that you're ever going to see due to the way that she builds. Her mid game is definitely strong. I think this is going to be a really close one. I'm actually really surprised that Alliance is not offensively trialing this. I genuinely am. When you look at just how susceptible this could be, and we can see the creep skipping being done by Bulldog using the 
bear to pull creeps. Kuro and Puppy doing their best to try and block this out. The bear's going to be able, should be able to get away. It's going to be at about half health by the time all is said and done now. The Ancients are spawned. If they do this right, I actually saw, I might have been Navi that did this the other day. Bulldog's going to go ahead and come on down, meet up with the bear just to try and ward Kuro away. And this is actually a little bit more subtle than it seems. Kuro going to go for it. Nope, didn't get there in time. Bulldog should be able to get back before Kuro can snag the creeps. No, he actually looped him back around. And nope, not going to get him. So Bulldog going to get a free wave. So a little creep skipping, a little free experience for the Bulldog here in mid. Dindy setting up shop against S4. Interesting matchup. Two melee heroes in the Nyx Assassin versus the Tide Hunter. Tide very often can rely on uh, Anchor Smash to last it. And even with Mana Burn, Anchor Smash only 30 mana points to, uh, to cast. So shouldn't be too much of a problem. The one thing about getting Anchor Smash, though, is you can carapace it. As we can see, S4 just does it right there. It's pretty easy. Uh, the cooldown, of course, on carapace is really long at level 1, 23 seconds. But Dendi's still taking a quite a bit of harassment damage. Once he gets the bottle to him, though, it should be no problem. He'll be able to outpush S4, no issue whatsoever. And, of course, be able to have a, a little bit better chance of going for the runes. But, again, that's all based on what the supports are going to be doing. And speaking of support movement here, we have Kuro and Puppy. They're going to be smoked up, walking behind the Tier 1. Admiral Bulldog really needs to be careful. Bulldog usually with a great sense for this, and now he's going to realize too late just how much trouble he's in. Tether stun to lead things off. He has nowhere to go. Doing some damage, he will not be able to get him in. First blood goes to Kuro. Havos was taking a bit of damage, but in the end, well executed gank by Na'Vi. And getting things going right off the bat, Dindy giving a little bit of damage to S4, but in the end, Bulldog right back up, already taking more damage, will be netted down. Tether not long enough to get the tether stun off, and we can see taking a lot of damage, forced all the way back under his tier two. Very little damage done to the tier one so far, but you know, we've talked about it. We, you know, everyone knows, hang on, didn't he gonna eat an impale? But right click damage, probably not gonna be enough to do much, but make him a little bit angry. But just being able to delay Bulldog's development on the Lone Druid, hugely important in any match in which he appears. Yeah, and the poor guy right now doesn't even have a bear. I mean, this is a really sad Lone Druid at this point in time. He's only level 2. And Na'Vi, they have the capability of doing that, whereas Alliance can't really do the same thing with their supports. They're far less likely to move. These supports are essentially built to stack and farm the jungle, which is still going to be good for them because they're going to get experience and gold. But that also means that their offline tower is going to be dying uh, quite a bit faster unless Alliance do what they're doing now. And very nice play there out of mid. As we saw, Dindy twice faked the Anchor Smash to try and prompt the Carapace. Finally got him to bite Radiance on it once. One to nothing. Attack. Navi leads at three and a half. We can see EGM, Loda, and company wanting to bring down this top tier one. Opposed, just happy to sit back and farm for them. And Funnick is sitting at just level one, so it has been quite a struggle for him. There's the, uh, the Coddle Blast, as our buddy Toby Radiance would say. Also tower is under attack. And Ake rotating down to try and put on some pressure. Bulldog making his way into the jungle. Just has to abandon that bottom lane. Really no way for him to expect to get anything else at this point. Yeah, he's going to leave some experience, I would imagine. Or I guess right now, just kill the small camp. I mean, this is, this is not what he wants. This is definitely not a good situation for him. But still, uh, Navi pulling a bit ahead here in the early game. Also have to remember, though, this is a free farming alchemist again. And he's going to have his Midas at about the same time he did in the last game. So we're looking at four and a half minutes, five minute Midas coming out from Loda. I think though Navi can punish it this time. Again, because of the Dyer's fact that Kuro doesn't have to worry about splitting attack. experience with any other support. He can pretty much do his own thing, get to level six a little bit faster. Whereas Alliance's supports, they're just farming the woods. They're kind of doing their own thing. Ake is going to teleport bottom with basically no mana and not be able to use Coddle Blast. So that's a bit <laughs> interesting. Um, but. Looks like Na'Vi, they're going to be pushing the bottom tier 1 now. Havos has got two points into Azora. And this, is, this actually Dyer's should be the first tower kill of the game, I believe. Going to see Funnick join up as well. Going to go ahead and try to grab the creep wave. Got him just in time. And we can actually see Ake okay. sitting in the back. Going to load up with one good Illuminate. But really, only so scary when you have these three heroes here cutting the creeps. Trying to put that pressure on Ake, or excuse me, Loda, with Ake at top, and EGM may want to try to counter push sometime soon. There's that Midas coming out just right at the five minute mark. Alliance right now looks like they're not terribly interested in defending this tier one, so 
Navi walked away with first blood and heroes. They'll get first blood and towers as well. Great start for Navi, getting exactly what they need to get. And Funic, whenever he wants to, he can start going to the jungle now because Puppy at this stage, he really only needs a creep and he can just start moving around. You can still technically gank a Nyx fairly easily, even though, interestingly enough, S4 isn't leveling Mana Burn. He's actually putting all his points in a spiked carapace. And they are not stopping, by the way, in this bottom lane. Navi continuing to push in, Funic making some more treants. Um, but this is uh, this is interesting. Looks like Alliance are going to have to send Ake down here to defend. Ake trying to use the blast to keep things up. That tower's already down to about half health, though. In the meantime, we can see Alliance beginning to try to counter pressure the tier one. Certainly not the situation you want to be in. This tower is going to end up dropping for sure. A little bit of loosen beam spam to run Ake off. But yeah, they're, they've just Radiant's given away an entire lane's worth of towers right at six minutes. And they have yet to even bring down the tier one top. They could defend this. They have a glyph. Doesn't look like they're going to, though. Instead, just going to try to continue playing very, very safe and build upon the lead they've already generated. Six and a half minutes in, and we can see on the back of the first blood in those two towers, we're coming up on 2,000 gold in favor of Na'Vi. Well, this is nice because now the supports of Na'Vi can just sit in the jungle and do whatever they want. Pulling is going to be effective here for Kuril. He'll be able to get level 6, and once he does, you can start bringing Havost around the map. Now that he, of course, has his level 6, you really want 7 to make sure that Lucent Beam is maxed out before you start using your ulti to try to go for kills. But the possibility is now there. You don't have to just sit in the bottom lane anymore, and since both of those towers are dead, the jungler can start rotating around mid. So Na'Vi opening themselves up the map a little bit more than Alliance, but it's not to say that Alliance are really that far behind behind and honestly the only reason Navi are even ahead in gold is because of the tower kills otherwise the supports of Alliance being forced uh, to jungle and things like that because they have a keeper of the light they are going to get a little bit more experience we can see EGM is level 5 actually halfway to level 6 Ake though is the one of the supports who is actually suffering being forced to go bottom and not able to kill his jungle stacks you see Luna is going to go ahead and straight up by the drums very typical build coming out of her drums BKB, very, very solid. Still sitting on just tier one boots, see if she wants to go with the Tranquils and everything else. But Pavos getting himself into a position where he can fight, gonna be very important. Again, you have an IO, you have a global presence times two in the Nature's Prophet, and the IO, that's something they're gonna wanna start putting through its stretches very soon. Loda, of course, with that Midas, we saw just how quickly he was able to get up the key items he needed the most, namely the BKB and the Shadow Blade. And those items came out so fast in game one that it almost felt as if Navi was taken by surprise. They just so completely ran out of momentum. There was very little they could do once things got out of control and they lost two team fights in a row. Still very early on, though. Sitting at eight minutes in, and both teams, and really not as much movement as I would think. I mean, again, you have Relocate, Io. Taking a look at his level, he's almost level 6. Well, he's level 5 now, he'll be making his way to level 6. Once we get there, that's bound to be the word go for this Navi squad. Now, he really needs it. S4, he's got a double damage, he's looking for Funic bottom. Funic gonna be impaled here, he's trying to TP away. DD, he's gonna sprout himself in and he can't get in! Doesn't have the impale or anything else to seal the deal, so Funic. Dodging a bullet there, or a pincer, more accurate. Dyer's middle tower is under attack. At middle lane, Ake is doing some counter pushing here. Coddle Blast only level two, and that's how powerful it is. This is another reason why Luna hasn't really seen a whole lot of play lately, is because she's so weak in the early game. She needs BKB. Uh, Drum's obviously a good choice as well, just for the sole purpose of giving you that added mobility and the extra health as well. But Navi really want these towers. They want to try to open up the map as soon as possible because the more room you have to use, the better heroes like Nature's Prophet and Wisp actually become because you can sit on opposite sides of the map and top lane. Top lane, we're going to have Dendi able to TP away in the meantime in mid. Tier 1 will end up dropping. Dindy hooks up with the rest of his team. Now Dindy is level 8. And he is making his way towards a mechanism. We see Puppy kind of out by himself at the moment. He's going to spot out Bulldog. And he's got a whole team behind him. Let's see if they want to react. They're going to push on through. And the threat of Dindy's Ravage makes it so difficult for Alliance to come to a fight right now. That greedy build from Loda will pay for itself eventually. But for right now, he really can't contribute a whole lot of anything. Okay, doing his best to counter push, but Illuminate only goes so far, they're gonna be forced to use the Glyph. And if they're not real careful, we can see S4 is counter pushing bottom. But if they're not real careful, they're gonna begin to really feel the pressure of a loss of map control. Dindy at about half health, being healed up by the nature's attendants. Illuminate gonna catch nothing but creeps that time around. Loda has shown the flag here in mid. And let's see if that's enough, yep. 
Navi gonna go ahead and bail out. We'll see if they're gonna pursue. In the meantime, if Ose comes down, does get the deny. And Nick's assassin escapes denied. under cover of Vendetta. Really nice movement from Navi. Once Dendi finishes up the mech, which I actually believe he'll be finishing quite soon, it's really difficult for Alliance to fight them. They don't have a hero who's going to have a mech anytime soon unless the Alchemist decides to pick it up. And of course, they'll only play him as a one roll, so that's very unlikely. Uh, I actually think that Navi have a pretty distinct advantage here. They haven't even gotten Wisp to level 6, and Alliance just haven't really been able to make anything happen. They get a, a deny on the tier 1 as well, so Navi getting more gold taken away from their opponents. and. This right now is definitely uh, Navi's gold lead experience, though, going the way of Alliance just because of the fact that, again, uh, EGM really hasn't moved anywhere. He's just been sitting top pretty much the whole time, and he's been able to get quite a huge chunk of experience, whereas Kuro has basically been following Havos around the map, just soaking his. So not necessarily being the most efficient in terms of experience, but again, opening the map is important here. You don't want to give Alliance any extra room, especially since Bulldog has been left alone for quite some time now. He's almost, well, for an offlaner, he's almost fully recovered. He's actually sitting at the fourth highest CS right now at 41. Granted, those are some jungle creeps still, Pretty uh, spectacular that he's managed to come this far this quickly. And looks like Navi's ready for round two. Hooking up here in mid lane. Alliance gonna try to hold the line. Puppies, the one bringing up the rear. In the meantime, we can see EGM is yet to show up. This tower will end up going down. They're gonna try. Very nice carapace there. And try to get the deny, and they do. So Navi gaining the map control, being robbed of a little bit of gold. But nonetheless, that's only two outer tier towers remaining for Alliance at this point. And an, an only two they've taken down on the other side. They are going to immediately smoke now. S4 obviously out front. Let's see. They're going to bypass the Roche pit. They're going to go headhunting. UGM, Song of the Siren, as he is level 7, does have that. And looks like Navi's not really going to be in the vicinity. I think they might just turn around and do Roshan after they see everybody from Navi top because Alliance clearly have shown the intent of not wanting to fight yet. They probably want another item unloaded before they do. At the very least, a Shadow Blade, which he's devastatingly close to. But he doesn't have a TP, so he'll probably try to get the money for it, go back to base, buy a Shadow Blade, or send it to himself, and then send a TP as well. But by that time, I think that Navi are going to have enough to get to the tower and possibly just push it down before he even has a chance to react. So maybe Roshan would have been a little bit easier to get. Clearly, Navi would have been out of position for it. And with Kuro now level 6, they can wish teleport. They might just try to go on Ake, but of course he is going to teleport actually to the tier 2 as soon as he shoots that eliminate. And we can see the tower stands no chance. Navi bringing down the next to last tower, standing on the side of Alliance. Alliance again playing a little bit greedy this game, and Navi drafting a team that is so hard to engage into when you're lacking those key items. Again, the BKB. Really essential for the second game in a row. The Shadow Blade gives him at least a little bit more punching power. But at this point, I mean, what can Alliance do? They're standing right outside. This is the last outer tier tower remaining. They're going to end up trading a tier 1 for a tier 2, but that's a trade Navi is going to be quite happy to make. And yeah, they can't do anything. So down it goes. Not a single outer tier tower remains now for Alliance, who leads this series 1 to nothing. Navi. In the first 15 minutes, held the first 14 minutes of this game, have done everything they possibly can to set themselves up for a run in the mid game. Well, Lions definitely the ones being pressured here, no doubt about it. And trying to find room to farm against a Wisp and a Nature's Prophet when you don't have any outer tier towers, that is going to be a tall order to fill. And Navi smoked up potentially looking for a gank. Looks like they're going to try to go for Bulldog, but when you have full map control like this, I think it's almost in your favor to just do Roshan. I think, yeah, that's probably going to be their choice. They do have heroes who can tank it. They have an Enchantress heal, they have a mech, they have a Tidehunter Ravage. Even fighting around the pit, especially with Eclipse, when Alliance have no damage soak for it at all, I think would be pretty favorable. Granted, Let's remember that Na'Vi, they've been playing five men, so they are kind of level starved on their heroes. Their highest right now is Dendi. Uh, he's level nine. And then the other heroes are pretty much level six and five if you're Enchantress. We can see Na'Vi poked their nose in. S4 going to be spotted. It's a two-man impale. And doesn't have Vendetta anymore. 40 seconds. Funix there gets the sprout off. He's going to mana burn him, but that's not it's about all he can do. He does carapace. Lucid Beam slows him down. He will end up dropping here. So Navi notches another kill, and Alliance, no interest whatsoever in taking a fight to the point that they all just turned and ran. And this, this might just be an Aegis they're willing to concede just to buy time for Loda. 
Yeah, but is buying time really going to do enough for them right now? They need more, actually. Admiral Bulldog is doing some lane balancing here at bottom while Roshan is being attempted by Na'Vi, so he's trying to go for the Radiance. He actually has enough for a Relic at 15 minutes. I mean, to be honest, the recovery rate of Admiral Bulldog this game is completely insane. Yeah, he's got his Relic at 15 minutes after starting off getting first-blooded and being a level 2 with no bear. So Na'Vi, in the meantime, they do secure their Aegis. Havos is going to pick it up. But at some point, these heroes are going to start to need some levels. I would actually like to see them maybe split it for a little while, get Havos to level 11. Level 2 Eclipse is significantly better than level 1, and you can actually maybe crack the base at that point. But then again, giving time to Loda is probably something they won't want to do, considering he's over halfway to his BKB right now. I don't know, this is still tough for Na'Vi. Even though they have all the towers down, the game still feels very, very close, and it's only going to take one fight for Alliance to crack the game open. The game feels very, very close because it still is, at least by the metrics. You're talking 2,500 gold, all that separates these two teams. The experience is actually, as you mentioned, in favor of Alliance. And yeah, when it, cracking Tier 1s and Tier 2s, taking Roshan's one thing. When you're talking about it, you, they are under the gun to begin taking Tier 3s, or at least applying adequate pressure to force Alliance back into the base, force Loda off a of farm, slow him down. This is where things, as you said, really do get tricky. We can see with that Aegis, they are emboldened a bit. A DD on a boat certainly going to help them a bit. Hey, they might get a free bear if they can catch it. Bulldog going to lose a bear, 300 gold. Picked up by Havos there for free. Certainly a nice bonus for him, but more importantly, with only one bear at his disposal, Admiral Bulldog with the relic on the bear even. Still not going to feel all that scary. If they can get the bear one more time, he'll be fresh out. And they are trying to crack it, Dindy. With plenty of mana. He's actually picked up a plate man on top of everything else. His farm has been so good. And the rest of Na'Vi sitting right at the foot of the steps with him. Alliance has to gather. But at the moment, it looks like they will go ahead and pull back. Now this is actually, if, they, if they're able to force Na'Vi back, this is a significant win for Alliance. The more time they can buy for Loda to get out onto the map, he only needs another 100 gold for his Mithril Hammer. So now he has it, only needs 1,300-ish to finish his BKB. That BKB is going to be a game-changing item when it does come out. Now the question is, is it going to be game-changing enough? Because the rest of his team is not going to be as fortunate as he is. And unlike Gyrocopter, you can get kited out pretty easily by Luna. Luna's the fastest hero in the game. So can he actually stick to a target without the help of his teammates, like EGM being able to ensnare and a stun from S4? Because once the Luna gets a BKB as well, her ultimate is more of a contributor to a team fight than an Alchemist's single target damage at this point in the game. That's why I wanted to see them split up maybe a little bit earlier and try to get some more experience on Havos. But they back up. Uh, giving an opportunity for Loda to farm a BKB is, of course, going to be an inherent risk for the reasons that you stated. But I think for Navi it's okay as long as they efficiently farm for the next couple of minutes and at least Radiant's apply some pressure. But they're really attack. not able to do that right now. Alliance realized Na'Vi, they're fully back, so they're farming their woods. Everyone is getting back to doing what they should be doing. Admiral Bulldog's getting closer to his Radiance. This game is still very, very far from over. The interesting thing about it is Na'Vi's still just so low level. I mean, it's 18 minutes in, and your mid isn't even level 10. Avos picks up the BKB. Aegis us. will be reclaimed in about three minutes. And Loda, again, just about where he needs to be. Very quiet game already, and really, again, that's not just because neither team wanted to fight. Navi has been just bouncing around the map, rattling their saber in every single tower to the point that no more towers stand, so it wasn't as if they weren't looking to pick a fight. Alliance just knowing they would be at an inherent disadvantage has allowed the game to reach this point. And both teams playing ultra, ultra safe. We are going to see three hook up here in this bottom lane again. Dindi, Havost, and Kuro. Going to bounce past the river. We'll see how much they want to force this. Level 10 on Dindy. We have yet to see a Ravage. And uh, yeah, really, we have yet to see a major fight. But now another key item. Bulldog picking up the Radiance on the Bear. That's going to make it so much more difficult for Na'Vi to crack these Tier 3s. Just having the Bear there, that burn damage. Trying to extend these fights is going to be something Alliance excels at. They are fairly tanky by their own nature. They're fairly tanky in the Lone Druid, fairly tanky, of course, in the Alchemist. Once he pops Chemical Rage, you have some, uh, Song of the Siren. And now, with the Radiance done and the BKB done, Alliance, for the first time, ready to take fights on their own terms. This is going to be really, really risky for both teams. I mean, it's not just to say that Na'Vi should win the team fight straight out, but Dendi may be a little bit out of position here. Vendetta, and he pops the haste room. Beautiful, beautiful reaction time. Actually going to gush out S4 and chase him down. 
And the Carapace keeps him from Anchor Smashing. There's an Illuminate and the Impale. Dendi way out in front. The rest of his team now finally beginning to catch up. And again, you know, something worth mentioning with Dendi and what he's done here. He's picked up the mech, which is fine. They're going to get the bear again. This is a very big deal. And here comes Funic, just to make sure. Trapping the bear. Down he goes. The caged animal is a dead animal. But the fact that Dendi did decide to skip the blink tag. He had enough gold to buy a plate mail to take himself up. Of course, the mech, one can understand, but lacking that mobility item, at least for now, he does have a 1,000 gold in the bank, though, and uh, we'll see if that's going to be his next decision. Well, the Blink Dagger is something that you get when you really need the Initiator, but honestly, Na'Vi haven't. I mean, they just walk into a tower and they kill it. If Alliance want to stop them, Alliance have to come to Na'Vi, not the other way around. So for the first six out of two towers, I think that not having a Blink Dagger is perfectly fine, considering... Let's be honest, Kuro wasn't getting a whole heck of a lot of farm. The guy has 9 CS at 21 minutes, so he's not going to be making it. And Puppy, of course, he's uh, bought himself an Ogre Club. So perhaps the BKB, more likely, I think, uh, at this point, in Aghanims just for the extra damage. So I think if he wants to buy one now, it would be reasonable. Shiva's, of course, is definitely on the table. You can even buy something like an AC if you want to make your push potential just that much better. But having the mana pool, of course, is nice if you ever want to go for a refresher on the Tidehunter. But still, Alliance, they're still getting farm. I mean, it's not like they're totally out of it or anything like that. The gold is still only 3,000 in, in Navi's favor, but they are starting to retain the experience as well. It's starting to swing back because, of course, Alliance has been forced into playing five-man themselves, whereas earlier Navi were the ones running around as five pretty much all the time. And Alliance, they're going into the woods. They could spot Puppy. Puppy, they got to look at him. They know he's there. Here comes the rest of Navi. The only one missing, Funic. He's down in the bottom lane. Of course, he can TPN. Doesn't look like Alliance is interested in it, though. They're going to go ahead and back again. We're at 22 minutes in, and we have seen a grand total of two kills. Certainly one of the most quiet games we've seen, not just you and I, but throughout the entire tournament. Just so much at stake. No team willing to take a chance on, uh, on, on anything. They're just playing so tight and so deliberate. But uh, again, you know, as more time goes on, we can look and see in net worth. The Alchemist is on top. He's opened up a bit of a gap, but right after that, three of the top four, all belonging to Na'Vi in terms of pure net worth. The Lone Druid, Admiral Bulldog, even though he does have his Radiance, still struggling quite a bit. Well, he is able to do some split pushing now with just the Radiance burn in general, and even Funnick is running away from this thing. That's how annoying the bear is. He's going to sprout it up and throw out some auto attacks, so he's doing what he can to force Admiral Bulldog's bear back. But I still feel like Na'Vi... It's hard to push the advantage, but I feel like they have to try to find a way to. Maybe Roshan is going to be their next choice, because having level 2 Ravage, level 2 Eclipse, and level 2 Wrath of Nature, that's a tremendous amount of AoE damage that, as it stands right now, Alliance don't really have a way of stopping. Their team does not have a mech. So having a mech, having that AoE potential, magic damage coming out of Na'Vi, this is still, I think, their game, at least in terms of map control, of course, and having the capability of pushing. But once Alliance get maybe 10, 15 more minutes, there's going to come a stage where the Lone Druid's tankiness is going to be enough to compensate for that, and Lone, or the uh, Alchemist is going to have closer to a full inventory. The fact that Loda has BKB, Shadowblade, and Midas at this stage in the game, and now he's also sending himself a plate mail. That's kind of underfarmed, considering some of the alchemists that we've seen, which sounds crazy, but it's just because of the fact that he's been forced into more defensive posture than he's used to. Uh, there, there it goes. Navi and Alliance taking a look at each other down the ramp near the Roche pit. Roche will be responding in about two minutes, give or take. And right now, Navi just quite happy to try to put more pressure onto Alliance, and as you said before, trying to make that team engage into them now. Loda and company do have the ability to engage into them, especially now Loda with the plate mail, his armor going up significantly. He now has 13 as opposed to the previously low total. And they are going to go ahead and try to push the tier 2. That's going to open things up for Na'Vi if they want to try and rush down the tier 3. Don't think this is going to work, though. They can try to defend this, but this is where that bear does get dangerous. Now he is going to be sprouted in. Here comes the TP in. Let's see if they want to engage. There's an Illuminate. As they try to pull back, here we go, unstable concoction on the Dindy, the Impale's there as well. BKB is activated, and Song of the Siren comes in. Havos with the BKB, he's isolated. Waiting on Kuro, just buying time. The Illuminate cleans away the creep wave. EGM and Loda pull back. Havos will be able to track him down and get the kill. That's a double kill going their way. The Nyx Assassin dropped as well, but look at bottom. Kuro and Funnick hooked up. In the shadow of the tier three, trying to split push this down. Ake okay, there, throwing out the Illuminate. And here comes the rotation of Loda. They're going to engage and sprout on Ake, okay, but Funic going to be blown up. The Illuminate seals the deal. Kuro doing what damage he can. Might be able to right click Ake. Okay. Nope, one charge is pretty good. No! 
Double KO for the supports. They end up trading a couple more away apiece. The dust settles though, make it five to two. That tier two still standing for Na'Vi. Uh, that song by EGM actually totally backfired oh, for them. Did. They used the song to try to stop the Wiz TP from getting a counter kill, but that song actually saved Dendi's life. So they weren't able to take him down. All in all, uh, the two pushing bottom actually end up going down. Roshan spawning right now. So I think that Alliance might have a little easier of a time getting in position. But again, we, we still haven't seen a Ravage, if I'm not mistaken. Nope. Um, yeah, 25 minute game. Not a single Ravage was used that day. But yeah, Alliance, they're going to be going for Roshan here. They do have a bear. Actually, this is only one bear Roshan. So if they want to react to this Roshan, they're going to have to start making their way there now. Havos does not have a lot of HP right now. He really needs that Wisp to be there just to be able to use an urn on him. But yeah, they, they can't fight with Havos' low health unless Puppy has a heal. Going to go ahead and use Nature's Attendance. Taking their sweet time. Roshan down to about half health. They are going to be able to engage this if they really want to. Throwing out the Sprout. And that's enough. Showing the flag and forcing Alliance to back out, knowing that Na'Vi ready to come in force. And as you said, Dindy has not used a single Ravage. Now Na'Vi might take a run at the big boy. Here we go. They move in. Alliance is on the high ground. Illuminate does a smidgen of damage. You see Roshan spell shield popped. Funnick off by himself, trying to watch for the end around. Rosh just south of half health. Let's see how and when Alliance wants to go for this. Navi is committed. Havost is way far back, as is Dindy. They are in there until Roche drops or until Alliance comes in. Here we go. There's the acid spray. Lotus going to go for it. S4 is there. Tether stun. BKBs are up. There's finally a Ravage. Got S4. Rest of the fight engaged outside. There's an Illuminate that connects and a Riptide as well. Dindy trapped inside. Havost will drop. Lone Druid able to get him. And Dindy now being beautiful. Blinding light. Knocked it back. But here's the Eclipse. The Eclipse doing good damage. Loda. Has to make a run for it. No, sir! Killed off as he tried to make it uphill. Roshan still standing, as is Puppy, as is Havost. Took a buyback or two, but Na'Vi take what could be the most important battle of the game so far. No, Song of the Siren. Here comes the bear. Can they do it? Nope. Thinking better of it. They're going to try to force him out. Havost is in trouble. Illuminates there. Havost is gone. Puppy is gone. Roche is gone. Loda with the help of EGM, Admiral Bulldog, and Ake. Okay. Caught Navi, laying greedy, their hand in the cookie jar, and steal themselves an Aegis. What a turnaround from Alliance. I thought after the double buyback for Na'Vi that they would at least be able to secure Roshan, but the song from EGM, much better this time. <laughs> they managed to get the, uh, the concoction inside of the pit and basically just instantly kill the Luna, and that's one of the weaknesses of the hero. She just is not that durable without her BKB up, and you can focus her fairly easily. But the important thing to note here, Loda now level 16. His levels have gotten completely out of control right now. They get the Tier 2 Alliance. They seek, they overcome all these disadvantages, having all your outer tier towers taken away. They've almost equalized it. They even look like they want to try to crack the base. There's no glyph right now on Na'Vi, and Ravage is enough for another 45 seconds. This is, of course, the reason Tidehunter is so rarely seen now. Such a slave to his cooldown, and Dindy's out there a bit. Can they grab him? It's there on the puppy. They're going to engage off of a Kuro, and puppy are in trouble. One's down. Can you say two? I can. Havos trying to re-engage. Dindy, 30 seconds from Ravage. Loda with the BKB up. Doesn't want to turn and fight. Looks like his supporting cast has to pull back. Phonic tried to re-engage. Will be in snare down. They're going to try to finish him off, and they will. S4. Very close to death, Carapace through that last impetus, and Dendi chasing him down. Lotus there off the Aegis pop. Havos with his BKB activated. Beautiful and snare from EGM coming down from the high ground. Locking him down, Funnick is bought back. Dendi, one second until Ravage. Will he spend it? Can he spend it? He will hang on to it. Bulldog. Cleans up the kill. Phonics back up, trying to chase down S4. Another beautiful it's there in the mech. Kept S4 alive as he turns and extends the killing spree. 13 to 7, and a game that was led for so long by Navi has completely turned on its head. You've got three down, no buybacks. There's not going to be a tier three standing by the time all said and done. And the rack's going to be next on the list. Well, Ravage is up for when Dendi gets up, but this is definitely going to be a Rax. Like, there's nothing that Navi are going to be able to do to stop this. Puppy is sitting here. He doesn't have any creeps right now. And Alliance just coming back from the most ridiculous positions, able to just stay cool, calm, and 
they just effectively farm, even on maps where most teams would be scared to. They managed to make another tremendous comeback. And at any stage in the game, you would imagine that a team with no outer tier towers would feel obviously scared to be able to do anything on the map. They could test the Roshan, even against a Tidehunter with a mech, even against a level 2 Eclipse. With a double buyback, they still take the fight and manage to go in for that Rex. Just unbelievable performance coming out of Alliance here in Game 2. What I think it comes down to is what we knew it would. Whenever you see a Tidehunter pickup, that's very much a hero who, once the BKBs begin to come out, he just loses his efficacy. He loses his impact in a big way. And even with just one hero really being one that would want a BKB, the Dyer's fact that it is this hero is with attack. this supporting cast, we saw EGM's ensnare from the high ground so important in locking down a boast as he tried to retreat. If he's able to retreat, go back to the well and heal up, maybe that tier three is still standing. If not the, the tier three, maybe the racks. But there are just so many tools on the side of Alliance that they all know how to lose, use perfectly. We're going to see Funnic come in. He's going to Shadow Blade and Lotus sniffs it out. Smells the rat, may fall back. Now they might want to re-engage. Loda comes back out, there's S4. He blinked ahead, misses with the impale. Now Dindy trying to get in for a Ravage. Will spend it, got two, but the BKB was up on Loda beforehand. S4 right behind him, they get the Courier for free. And oh wow, he missed with the, uh, with the Sprout as well. Here we go, S4, beautiful impale, got two. Now the Eclipse, as Savos wants to re-engage, S4 makes it to the low ground. EGM, living because of the Mac Dindy. Trying to make it away, Poppy standing in the fight, but as these fights get drawn out, it's gonna go the way of Alliance. The burn damage on Admiral Bulldog alone, more than Navi can handle. EGM may be in some trouble. Havos cleaned up, Bulldog got a mega kill streak. There's Song of the Siren. And Dendi, the man left behind, gonna end up being zipped back to the well the hard way. Going back in a body bag as that's a double kill for Admiral Bulldog's lone druid. Navi feeds four. 17 to 8 in a 32 minute game and I do believe it's safe to say the worm has turned. Navi as you said cleared off every single tower from the map within the first 15 minutes. Every single outer tier tower looked to be in control but Alliance turning it completely around and really it's hard to imagine what's going to slow down this train now. You know it's a bit ironic after watching the way this game turned out like Navi basically losing the game because of the way Roshan went. If they had gotten there, Roshan could have been completely different. They might have had enough momentum to push into the middle racks of Alliance. And when you're a racks down against a Prophet team and a Wisp, it becomes significantly harder. But they lost the Roshan fight, so now looks like the base is going to get taken down again. Top lane fully exposed, no Glyph, no Ravage up on Dendi for another 50 seconds, and Alliance seemingly might actually be taking this 2-0. Havosh is going to be chopped to pieces, can't even get away! Loda, large and in charge, and with these kills, there it is! GG! In a match that was as highly anticipated as any in the history of Dota 2, Alliance puts together a 2 to nothing blanking of Na'Vi and punches their ticket to the Grand Finals! GG, well played indeed! Great performance out of Alliance. Even with very little map control, they managed to find farm. They managed to get the core items that they needed on every hero, win that really clutch Roshan fight. Even after Na'Vi had the double buyback, had the Wiz teleport back in with the Eclipse, and managed to turn the game around completely after, well, more or less one fight. So, spectacular performance out of them, and congratulations, well deserved. Absolutely, and really, I mean, 33 minutes, 7 seconds, the official game time, 9 to 20. The final kill score, we saw it, Draskal. These two teams out to play hard, but really, Alliance, and this is what has characterized their entire run through the international, holding things together, keeping things calm, not allowing setbacks. Well, I mean, can you even call it a setback when you lose six towers in 14 minutes? Nonetheless, Alliance punches their ticket to the grand finals, guaranteed. $600,000 in cash that they've now earned themselves. Navi, not out yet. They drop to the lower bracket. We'll see if they can fight their way back up from the bottom. I may see that Strassel throwing it back out to the analyst desk so they can break it down. Thank you, AC and Draskal. Yeah, Alliance and Navi, we won't be seeing any more of them today. They will wait to play until tomorrow, but Alliance are guaranteed a top two finish. I didn't think they'd win 2-0. I, I thought they might have been the favorites going into this. I thought so. But Me too. Come on.
How many <laughs> towers in 14 minutes? Six, and they have a Nature's Prophet. I, I was kind of surprised that the uh, Nature's Prophet didn't end up finishing a sheep stick or finding more farm, to be honest, because they be really fair, needed that. I was talking that. to Toby backstage, and I was telling him how Navi should have this game, and I expected them to breed spades at the 16 minute mark. They went uphill at 16.40. And I thought they should have just continued pushing in because I really felt that Navi had the better lineup. This was uh, sort of an old school lineup we saw a lot of in 2012, and it requires a lot of <coughs> balls to enter the base with. And, and Navi sort of seemed to lack that. And if there's any team I'd be surprised by not having the cojones to go into the base, it, it'd be Navi. And I don't know why they didn't. I think they were too anticipated, or uh, too frightened by the keeper of the light. All right. Well, yeah. Certainly, sometimes just the magnitude of the match at hand can change how you think and play uh, but a team that seemed to handle the pressure will of course alliance and that's where we're going now with a post-game interview with s4 thank you very much james yeah s4 is here and first off congratulations uh, quite a bit of a comeback there in that last game how did you do it uh, we knew what they were going to do they were going to take all our towers and just five men and uh, we res responded correctly we we didn't take the early fights because we knew they were stronger um, and we just farmed up our core items, and that's how we won the game. I'm really interested in the strategy behind drafting, especially when you're going up against a team like Navi. They had two heroes in this particular match we haven't seen in the entire tournament so far. What was your strategy when it came to picking the heroes for this particular matchup? Okay, so our plan going into this match was leaving Wisp against Navi because we, we're, we're pretty confident where we can play against Wisp and I don't think many teams uh, can say that. Uh, so yeah, uh, playing as Wisp was our uh, plan into this. How are you feeling? A little bit relieved? Yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right, congratulations. We will see you in the grand finals. That is fantastic. Thank you. James, back to you guys. Thank you, Casey. Yeah, relieved, I'm sure they are. And I, from the draft as well, they really did leave it open to Na'Vi to pick some really interesting lineups. So I felt they looked very confident just in the drafting phase. Did they play as confident as they drafted Alliance? I think every game we see them play, it's just confidence and trust in their teamwork and their team play. And even if they fall behind early on, they just execute their objectives every single time. It's just like watching a machine just trample over all the other teams. It's poetry in motion. Now, yeah. oh, sorry, Ben. Uh, I'm just really surprised that Navi went with Wisp the second game. I think that Alliance proved that they can handle the Wisp, and Wisp doesn't work the best in their push strategies. Alliance kind of like baited them in a pushing. I guess they just avoided team fights, played with Cottle as long as possible, and just waited for the perfect opportunity, which was the Roshan fight around the 27 to 28 minute strat uh, 28, 27 to 28 minute mark. Yeah, we can but, take a look at it here, Ben, yeah. if you want to take us through. So here's the Song of Siren, and there's an Illuminate being charged up by Aki right now, and it's going to hit Havost, and th they're so close to taking out Roshan right now. It wipes up the two Navi heroes, and this is. This is a straw that broke the camel's back. And Navi has such an advantage at this point, and it was just it was just sad to see that six tower early. It was like 15 minutes. They got uh, all the T1s and the T2s, but unable to break that T3. But they need to draft better, I think, to push up the T3. They had a very, very good early game fighting lineup, but Alliance was like, hey, we're not going to fight. They didn't have zero kills. They had zero kills for like 15 minutes. And if they want to take a fight at a T3, then Alliance has an advantage because they can fight at the choke. They have to combo for the Alk stun and the myriad of other spells that they had. Yeah, and Bruno, I want to ask something that was very kind of prominent in the games and just the draft itself was the Naga Siren again. Mm -hmm. It was picked both games. It seems to be a similar story to the last international. Yes. Um, but it was played.